to many of you over the past three decades, really, the 60s, and the 70s, and the 80s. You know, it seems like I personally, I know I've gone through a lot. I feel like collectively we have gone through a lot. And Ram Das has always spoken right to the point. It's always been very relevant. It's it's been very meaningful, and any of you who have read his books or have heard him, I think that, uh, that he clearly articulates and reflects who we are. And I think his own transformation and evolution from uh, social scientist and Harvard professor to sort of counterculture activist, drug leader, <laughs> to a real spiritual guy in the searching 70s, and to really now a person who's really being human. And I think he really represents what being human is. And he just is a, a very loving, nurturing uh, soul with a tremendous amount of wisdom. And I just am thrilled to have him here. And let's introduce him for a minute. downtown at the moment. <laughs> they get very light on. Why don't we just start our visit together by just getting here and quieting down and uh, Taking a few slow, deep, intentional breaths. awareness to your breath, just noticing as the breath on the intake, notice breathing in on the exhalation, notice breathing out. If it helps, you can focus on the inside of the tip of the nose where the air goes by and feel that very slight wind as it goes by. Don't feel you have to reject other sensations. Just gently and repetitively bring your awareness back to the breath. Each time the awareness wanders. traveling and all the expectations, let that all pass away and just come back always to the moment, to this moment of breath.
awareness is drawn to sensations in the body or to thoughts, notice it. And then once again, breathing in, breathing out. Notice how much the awareness is pulled <laughs> by sounds, by sensations in the body, by thoughts, by the judging mind, by planning, by remembering. Become an appreciator of the way in which your awareness is drawn now, here, now, there. And very gently, not with anger, not with judgment, Gently, just draw the awareness back to the breath. Again.
in this final minute of the meditation, bring renewed effort to keeping the awareness with the breath. Notice the in-breath, the point between the in-breath, the out-breath, the out-breath, the point between the out-breath and the in-breath. We'll complete the meditation with three sounds of Aum, one with each breath. Let the Aum come from deep inside. Let it happen to you. just did was a technique of meditation that comes out of the Theravada Buddhist tradition. The, method, the specific method is called Anapana. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a form of deepening the samadhi or concentration. how many times your awareness was drawn away from your breath, you can see where the path lies in that technique. Um, you could, um, you might take a course in uh, meditation, Vipassana meditation, in which uh, for the first three days, from six in the morning till 10 at night, all you were instructed to do was to follow the breath, tip of the nose. And uh, some of you can see where your limits would be. <laughs> uh, that's a, um, that's part of um, a form of yoga called Dhyan Yoga which is the yoga of meditation. And there are a whole variety of methods that we're going to be reflecting about this weekend. This is more like a Whitman sampler. <laughs> uh, instead of doing 10 hours of that first, uh, just give you a taste of these different meditations because um, from where I'm sitting, they all lead to exactly the same place. And yet they are very dramatically different and the reason they're different is because for different folks, there are different strokes. 
that you have a unique predicament and your unique predicament makes one method appropriate to you and others not appropriate at all. So that for one person to tell another what their method should be is slightly silly, really. Just because the method works for me doesn't mean it work for you. So all I can do is provide <coughs> options and show you what their, what their possibilities are. And then uh, you have to tune, as we're going to discuss this week. The weekend is just a chance for us as fellow human beings to hang out together and to explore what we are doing on Earth and how to become somewhat more conscious about the way we do it, or be it. I'm not a guru, I'm not an enlightened being, I am somebody just like you, who's exploring methods and working on myself. And all we do is we meet as explorers on a journey and we share maps and we get clues that might help us along the way. Of course, the weekend we're going to do some exercises, method, meditative meditations, some um, exercises, some movement, some mantra chanting. Uh, do some heart singing, uh, hang out together, questions and answers, ask Dr. Das. <laughs> <laughs> and in general, uh, be light together. Just because you are dealing with something that is profoundly significant to the human endeavor doesn't mean you have to be heavy about it. And uh, just humor and warmth is something that makes the whole process go much more easier. So if you're upset that I don't take it all seriously, <laughs> uh, just notice the upset. It's okay. every tradition there is a, a component of the tradition called crazy wisdom. Can you all hear me all right? Oh, that's nice. No? How many people in the back are having trouble hearing? If it's only one or two, maybe you better move up front. But, um, uh, <clears throat> the space up here on the floor, there's lots of space up here. <laughs> I'll try to project a little more, but it, um, it's hard to make love like this. <laughs> I'll aim just a little bit more towards the far end. Let's see if I can. In every tradition, there's um, something that is a uh, there is crazy wisdom in the, uh, there are the crazy tzaddiks and, and the chassids. There are the monks laughing at the moon in Zen Buddhism. In Sufism, um, there is a long tradition of that. And one of the best examples is somebody called Nasruddin. It's one of his names. And there are many stories about Nasruddin as people can make up. I don't know how many actually happen. But there is a story of Nasruddin going into a bank, cash a check. It was a large check. And the um, teller looked at the check. Nasruddin was a very disreputable looking fellow. And, Nas and the teller looked at the check 
And uh, the check looked all right. <laughs> but not <Nas> Rubin <laughs> didn't. And finally he said, uh, well, sir, the check seems fine, but can you identify yourself? <laughs> And uh, Sarudin reached into his pocket. He pulled out a mirror and he looked. He said, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting why we find that funny. Because of how much we are used to our cards of identity. My name, my social security number, my zip code, my address, my occupation, a whole set of labels that define who we think we are. It's this, um, lovely article that I've, I talk about all the time. From, it's from a Seattle newspaper. It shows a man behind bars and he was arrested for Forgery, I guess. And they found he had a, came with a briefcase full of stolen identification. And um, we can prove he's not who he says he is, says Detective Larry Baylor. <laughs> but we can't find out who he is. <laughs> Said John Doe, they're the ones who arrested me and convicted me. It's their duty to find out who I am. I know. <laughs> So he's basically bottled the system. <laughs> now it's interesting how subtle and yet how uh, how formal our identities are and how much we're attached to them. When, when you and I are born, very shortly after we're born, we go into somebody training. We start to be trained to become somebody. And we're trained by other people who know who they are. And they're going to teach us who we are. Very well-meaning, I mean, so that we can function in the world by being somebody. And you become mother's little girl or mother's little boy or somebody who eats all his carrots. You start to develop an identity after a while. You are good or you are bad or you are a rascal or you are... When I was very young, I must have maybe nine or so, I came from a Jewish middle class family and it turned out that the best thing to want to be was a doctor. That was somebody. Who are you? <coughs> somebody that's going to be a doctor. <coughs> and everybody gave you microscopes and books and patted you and smiled. And I milked that one until I was <coughs> well into college and was flunking histology and cytology and embryology. The moment of truth came. And we carry our somebody's around with us. And it allows us to be with other people in an efficient way. Now, just to get us all together into a metaphorical system, we can play in the game of metaphors any way you want. I mean, I depends on who you're talking to, you pick your metaphor, but let's I'm going to use one that just allows us to jump across systems easily. And if we all talk from the same one, it'll make it more fun to play. <coughs> so some of you have heard this many times because I do this almost every time I lecture. But um, think of how many times I've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just imagine that you have next to your eyes a television a channel selector okay? and you set the selector on channel one and now you look around 
and you see woman, man, old, young, thin, fat, dark, light. You see the physical beings. You see physical entities. You see endomorphs, ectomorphs, and mesomorphs. You're a scientist. If you are um, full of lust, you would be on this channel. It's a channel in which you would see other bodies as whether or not they would fulfill your fantasies. So you would see everybody as bodies, and you would see there's a potential, there's a competitor, and that's irrelevant. <laughs> see everybody as one of those three. And that's the physical plane. That's what you would see. Just channel one. It's standing on the corner. If you look at me, you see a 51-year-old bald man, Caucasian. And that's what you get on channel one. Probably irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> Flip to channel two. Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. <laughs> now you see happy and sad. You see seeker. You see responsible. You see laid back. You see all the social roles. You see responsible teacher. You see judge, you see politician, you see mother, you see child, you see all of these psychological, social dimensions channel two. If you're in psychotherapy, this is the real channel. <laughs> Nothing else is real, and everybody looks at me but you. That's the... Now, most of our cards of identity are on those two channels. <coughs> you ask somebody who they are, they will answer within one of those two. Channel two is <coughs> our storyline. Channel two is our psychological storyline, for the most part. It's, uh, it's the world turns. That's what channel two is. Where am I going? Where did I come from? Will I make it? That's the <laughs> I'm lousing it up. I, I can only get over this. It's all that's all channel two. Channel two. I'm a warm, affable, intelligent, charming teacher. <laughs> channel three is what we call a new age channel. <laughs> Scorpio. <laughs> In channel three, there are twelve of us. <laughs> channel three is also our mythic channel. It's the archetypes. It's the uh, like I am um, the Buddha giving the sermon in the beer park. Uh, <laughs> The room is full, filled with earth mothers and uh, <laughs> seekers after the Holy Grail. Uh, we all have these very big mythic roles also, besides our uh, more paltry psychological selves. We got bigger games we're playing, a larger warp and woof of things. Now, notice about these first three channels that they are all what you might call matrices of individual differences. There are ways we can peg each other. Channel three, I'm an Aries. <laughs> so if you go home and somebody say, who did you hear this weekend? You can say, I heard a 51-year-old bald, <laughs> Caucasian man, warm, charming, affable teacher, Aries, and they say, oh. <laughs> Then they know, and it's... <laughs> Notice that in the astral plane, later on they say, you, What are you? I'm an Aries. Right, of course. And as if now that explains everything. And each plane up explains more. It actually does. It explains. It's a, it's a 
system, but it's, it's a system, it's a matrix of individual differences in which you are different from you, from you, from you, from me. And we can peg each other. It's a world of individual differences. <laughs> Channel four. Now you look into the eyes of another being and you see another being just like you looking back at you. Are you in there? <laughs> I'm in here. How did you get into that one? <laughs> And what you see at that moment is another awareness just like you, but packaged differently. And you see channels one, two, and three as packaging. And this channel four, that entity, is in Christianity, it's called the soul. It's the eyes are the windows of the soul. So you see another soul just like you, but who's having an entirely different set of life experiences because they're packaged differently. And you see how much the package affects what their experience is all about. The package includes all the desires, all the fears, all the hopes, all the social perceptions. So if you and I are meeting on channel four, see, it's, if we're meeting on channel one, we're meeting in um, Snowmass at Windstar in a room. If we're meeting on channel four, we're just these souls who happen to be sharing a moment wondering what we're doing on earth comparing notes. And the time and space of this is just somewhat incidental to the forms we happen to be meeting in at this moment. If you flip to channel five, it's like two mirrors facing each other. You see yourself looking at yourself, looking at yourself, because in channel five there's only one of us. That's Shema Yisroel, I don't know, Yalochino, I don't know. The hero is real about our God, the Lord is one. It's not one plus Dorothy. <laughs> or one plus Pete, it's just one. So from channel five, we are one in drag. Or we are one at play. And if you were the one in channel five, well, what'll I do? You wouldn't say today, because you're not in today there, but you'd say, oh, well, what'll I do? I think I'll become the many. It's like, I think I'll play hide and seek. Then you become the many, and then you bring your awareness down, and you go into a little one of it. I think I'll go into some of it, like this one. And then you look out at the rest, and you say, oh, God, it's scary. <laughs> and you see others as them, and then you get all scared. You say, okay, all y'all are free, and you come back into the one. That was heavy. <laughs> I'll play that one again. So from channel five, we are the one at play as the many. And just to keep the Buddhists happy, we flip to channel six, where you disappear, I disappear, and the channel selected disappears. None of it is, was, or it's all void. <laughs> Okay, now we have a system to play with. <clears throat> now when I talk about you being born and going into somebody training, the somebody training you specifically went into was primarily channels one and two. And the anxiety that was attendant to the way in which you 
started to become somebody. Let me point out, when you are born, you're not busy being separate. It's all one thing to you. It's all one undifferentiated thing. And then something along the way comes along and you start to see that you aren't all of it. Or you start to get identified with being part of it. I, mean, I don't know. I have a suspicion that my critical moment was when I bit my mother's breast. And she said, hey, that's not yours. <laughs> that's mine. You know? She pushed me away. There was something that happened where suddenly I had a sense that I did something that I fell out of grace. I was no longer at home in the universe. I was a separate entity that felt a, a yearning to get back. I suck, I eat, I grab, I want, I try to incorporate, I try to come back into the one. I am now a separate entity. I learned separateness somewhere along the way. I bought into my separateness. And the emotional loading with which you do that means that you get very, very concerned about who you are. It's called ego development, your identity. And in order to be functional in the world, to be as a separate entity to survive, because you begin to feel there's this vast power around you and you experience impotence or inadequacy or whatever the, the roots of human neuroses are, you develop a sense of separateness and there is this vastness and you're always trying to make it all right to come back in, whether you come back in through eating, through collecting, through your eyes, drawing in, through later through all of the achievements through sexuality, always trying to come back into the one, into the unity, into the feeling of being in the Tao, in the harmony of things, in the way of things, instead of being separate. And the most powerful vehicle you have on channel two for developing your separateness and your computer system for functioning efficiently as a separate entity, where I'm me and you're you, is your thinking mind, your analytic thinking mind, your conceptual mind. Now, if, as is the case for most people, the need of that separateness to be sure it knows where it is and how it is and are you my friend or my enemy and who can I get what from and is it safe and where do I go and where don't I go? This map, uh, the map built from the place of my separateness. I am so attached to those identities on channel one and two that all the information that comes to me from channels three, four, five, and six I, in effect, reject. It's all there. You exist on channel one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, this is the model we're playing with, and if it gets too far out, just assume I took too many drugs in the 60s or something. <laughs> but assume the information is coming in on every one of these channels as to who you are. Channels one, two, three, four, five. But you're so attached to channels one and two <coughs> that the other information on these other channels you treat, and what the words you use are um, irrelevant, or error, or I was out of my mind, or I spaced out, or I'm losing it, or I don't know what just happened, or like when I first took psilocybin, the mushrooms, um, and I had these experiences which were, um, like I experienced that I was perfect. You know, that I was part of the universe and it was all perfect. Well, I know I'm not perfect, says channel one and two. So what I do in order to preserve my model of myself, which is certainly inadequate and not perfect, is I say of that experience, 
because I'm a psychologist, you remember, a professor of psychology, I say, interesting hallucination. <laughs> you see, I have a label. It's called a reductionistic label. It's a label that makes it less than <coughs> important. It's not real. Because my father used to say, Rich, come down to reality. <laughs> Which meant get a job. <laughs> together on this planet. Now, as William James said in 1906, he said, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all apart about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there may lay other types of consciousness. By other types. We may spend our entire lives without knowing of their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus, and there they are in their completeness. Their existence forbids our premature closing of our accounts with reality. But most of us do. We say, this is reality, and all the rest of that is, is la-la land. It's playing. It's out there somewhere. In some, somewhere along the line, now most people spend their entire lives with an identity in channels one and two. And it's as if they have created a, um, a room for themselves with their mind of who I am and what is me and what is not me and how it all is. And then they, no matter how miserable the room is, they will never step out of it. I mean, it, I get images of, uh, I've seen a, that photograph in the paper of a, a battered child who's been burned with cigarette ends by the mother and just very badly battered and the child is in the arms of a police matron who looks very motherly and very loving and very soft and she's taking the baby away and there's the mother who looks very very angry and very bitter and hard and the baby is screaming for its mother it's that one it's the one of um maybe some of you saw it uh, it was on pbs uh of um moving wild animals, like uh, moving a uh, tiger from a place an island's going to be flooded to a, an absolute tiger paradise. <clears throat> and they use a uh, tranquilizer and they get the lion in the tiger into the cage and then they move the cage by boat and then they put the cage on the new land and they open the door of the cage. And here is tiger paradise, everything the tiger could possibly want. And the tiger won't leave the cage. And if you go to take the tiger out, it would kill you. And it'll sit in that cage because it's familiar. It knows where it's at. But somewhere along the line for us, for some people in some birth, <coughs> There is what's called awakening. And at the moment of awakening, what awakening is, is that you acknowledge the channels three, four, five, and six, specifically four, five, and six, have some reality to them. You allow that they are potentially real which means that the channels one and two, which previously you were treating as absolutely real, now are only relatively real. So what you have done in that moment is you have done to your social perception what Einstein did to Newtonian physics. As you learn Newtonian physics, I learned Newtonian physics as this is absolute truth. And then Einstein came along and said, depends on where you're standing. <laughs> and he just shifted from absolute to relative reality. Now, how that awakening occurs for any individual is as varied as there are individuals. 
When you are ripe for that awakening, a leaf can fall, who knows? See, I, in the 60s, was part of a club of people who had all awakened through better living through chemistry. And we, we would have these club meetings, which were, you know, I know, and we just reassure each other that we do. And then we look at those that don't know. And we all identified the experience we were having with our method. So we were the psychedelic generation. Meaning mind manifesting or meaning moving into ecstasy or ecstasis, meaning out of the static, meaning out of any place to stand, moving into these other planes. And I've got this great image that I have repeated at many lectures because it's such a beautiful image of once lecturing to the club. All of the club used to look, they all used to dress the same way. Everybody used to wear white and they smiled a lot and they had flowers and they all smiled and they knew, you know. <laughs> a lot of repressed aggression. Um, and and uh, one, at one lecture that was um, the club, and I was sort of an uncle to the club. That was my role. And down the front row, there was a woman who was in her late 60s. And she had on a hat that had little strawberries and cherries on it. She had a black patent leather bag and a um, print dress and responsible looking Oxfords. <laughs> and I would say uh, these things that only those of us that knew would know. <laughs> And she would go like this. <laughs> and I became aware of her in the front row, and I thought, how does she know? <laughs> I mean, this is, she's not an acid head, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> so I'd say something more esoterically outrageous that only people that have really been playing out between channels five and six would even think relevant. She, <laughs> Maybe she has a nervous, you know. I saw her went to see whether she only responded at certain moments. When she did, she only responded when I made a point. And so at the end of the lecture, I smiled broadly at her, and she came over, and she said, thank you so much. She said, that was just, felt just right. I understood that perfectly. It was, that's just the way I understand it to be. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> what is it you have done that allows you to know? these things we're talking about. She leaned forward very conspiratorially and she said, I crochet. <laughs> and at that moment, I sort of knew that the game wasn't the one I thought it was. Because until then, I always identify the method of getting somewhere where you got with your method of getting there. And what happens to all of us is, if your method is crocheting, you can't understand why everybody isn't crocheting. Well, crocheting is the only way. You know? That's your way. If you do it through Zen sitting, you just feel so sorry for those poor slobs that don't sit. How much do you sit? <laughs> if yours is skiing, you can't believe that other people could be living here and don't ski. If it's sex, you mean you are celibate? You, know, you just can't conceive of it. It's just inconceivable that somebody would throw away the ecstasy of transcendence. But yet, when you look around, you see that people arrive at that by a tremendous variety of ways. And you see, when you, when you can separate the method from where the method takes you, you can hear that same quality of delight in a surfer, in a skier, in a sexual aficionado, in a uh, booyah base cooker, in a, uh, a cabin builder, in, you know. In a problem solver, problem solver. I mean, Einstein just went into ecstatic states. 
He went into places. He transcended. He went into places. He said, I didn't arrive at my understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe through my rational mind, which is rational minds in channel two. He went into some other way of knowing the universe, which we're going to talk about in a minute. <coughs> Is everybody here? Is it okay? If anybody's upset or angry or frustrated or wants your money back or anything, the time. don't be miserable. It's not worth it. You're not going to get to God any faster this way than going out in the snow. On the side of the So once you start to awaken, now there are qualities that you, when you come into what William James said, are these places of consciousness that were there all the time, and they're there in their completeness, and the minute you come into them, you feel very familiar with them. You feel you're at home. It doesn't feel strange at all. Now, uh, you, and when you come into them, you think, oh, this is so wonderful. I feel so relaxed. I'm no longer separate. I feel part of everything. Oh, I'm never going to leave this, you say. Like you go to church and you start to sing. And you're singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And suddenly it all opens up and there's the angels and the trumpets and the chariots and the whole mishpacha are all here. And it's all here. And you, look, and you look at everybody in the congregation. They're so beautiful. And they're my brothers and sisters. You love them. Your fourth chakra just opened. And you say, oh, I'm never going to change. This is all. I'm always going to feel this way. And it may last until um, dinner when somebody else gets the leg or something. For some moment, you pull back into your separateness. In In the street jargon, it's called going up and coming down, getting high and coming down. And for me, for many years, I thought the game was to get high <laughs> and get rid of my down. Because when I got high, I was one with the universe. I felt it was all so clear. It was so light. It was, and all the stuff that brought me down, I would put over there. And I would divide the world into that which kept me high and that which brought me down. And I'd say can't go home and visit the folks, they bring me down. <laughs> Starting to have these little categories of life for that. Can't work in the world, business money brings me down. You know, it was all these things that bring you down. And you try, you know, you get all pumped up and you'd be the Christ heart and the Buddha mind and you'd be all smiling, you go home, you'd walk in the house. Got a job yet? <laughs> So you go out and you try again and you pump up some more and you work another year and you come in, you might last a minute and a half. <laughs> because they know where your somebody is, this is, they trained you. They know exactly where they'll get where your Achilles tendon is. <laughs> Vulnerability is, because it resonates perfectly. Now, when you go into these other altered states of consciousness, as they're called, or come into the spirit, if you want it in a religious metaphor, <laughs> there are things that you see that are very different from the way you see them in what's called normal waking consciousness, or channel two. Like when you are looking at the universe from channel five, from the way God sees it, just outside of time and space, just you're just awareness and it's just looking at forms, looking down or at, out at forms, all form. What you become aware of is that all form is law, is lawfully related. That the nature of form is that it is 
connected to everything else in a lawful way. It's all changing lawfully. All forms change, and all the change is lawful. And you just see it. You see law everywhere you look. You can look at it in genetics. You can look at it in quantum mechanics. You can look at it in music. You can look at it in archaeology, astronomy, astrology. You can look at it in the Kabbalah. You can look at it in the I Ching. You can look at it in the Quran. You can, etc. Law. Law, 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 everywhere you look, you see law. And you see everything is related to everything else lawfully, including your body. And when you see all this law related, which includes psychology and sociology and suffering and death and violence, and it's all lawful, from that point of view, when you look at it and you just see the law, you say, it's perfect. As you see, the perfection of the law made manifest. So it's all perfect. But then you come back down into your human heart. Perfect? I mean, you look at the world, does it seem perfect to you as a human being? The suffering, starvation, violence, Paranoia, the fear in people. Look in yourself. Look at your own suffering, your own neuroses. Want to call that perfect? Paradox. What would be a paradox to the rational mind? Paradox. Perfect? Not perfect. If you buy the reality of your human heart, which empathizes, it's sure not perfect. If you go up, it's perfect. So wouldn't you rather stay in a place where it's all perfect? That's the model of high. Let's get high, where it's all perfect. It's all perfect. <laughs> Spill the Coca-Cola, perfect. <laughs> Somebody falls down in front of you and you say, karma. <laughs> It's a very cold place. It's a very impersonal place. But it's a very safe place. You're just seeing form lawfully manifest wherever you go. And it's all just doing perfect. Nuclear bomb may fall, right? Well, we're all lawful. Now, um, I think for many years what I tried to do was just to get high and to push away my lows, stay away from the things that brought me down in myself and in everyone else and figure they'd go away sooner or later. And I suffered from what you could call vertical schizophrenia. I mean, I even had two names for it. It was Dick Albert, and then there was Ram Dass. And Ram Dass was saw everything as love and everybody as brothers and sisters and it was all unfolding of the law. And down here as Dick Alpert, he was greedy, lustful, frightened, neurotic, human. And I sort of felt that somehow, because I wore a beard and I wore a, an Indian garb and beads and I was Ram Dass and I smiled a lot and I got everybody to want me to be those higher channels. People came to get high off of me. I take them into these other channels. Yeah. You'll get used to being on earth. <laughs> but no matter how hard I pushed, Dick Alpert didn't go away. And it got very, it, the, the hypocrisy is ugly. Because you go out in the street and you're robbed us. <laughs> Dick Alfred's best. Where, you know, and he was absolutely, he was irresponsible. He was, he was heavy duty. I mean, somebody would come and say, oh, Ram Dass, you're so beautiful. It's so wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for your books and you've given me so much. 
and I'd hear Dick Alpert say, <laughs> wouldn't you like to come up and see my holy pictures? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, when you come down in the at the human level, on the channel one and two level, the amount of suffering is so painful to see it, to stay open, to keep your heart open to the amount of suffering in the world is so painful that you finally have to close your heart down. Or you either close your heart down to function down there, or you go up. Those are the really two choices you have. You either sort of burn out by closing down. That's what most like nurses and doctors do. They have to face suffering and death each day, or people that work in things where there's just so much suffering, you can't even begin to conceive of ending it. No matter how hard you work, you end up becoming professionally warm. You just close down a little bit. You just close your heart down a little bit. And it louses up your relationships, your family, everything. But that's the way it is. You just can't bear it. Or else you go up into that just karma, impersonal life. Those are the kind of options you have. Because how do you begin on the human plane to handle all the suffering? You've got to fix that one, put your finger in that hole in the dike, and that one's leaking. And you've got to do that one, and that one's leaking. And where do you even begin? And you know, I'm sure you are all in the good guy mailing list just like I am. <laughs> and I sit with pen poised over checkbook. Well, is it going to be the whales? Is it going to be the battered children? Is it going to be the nuclear movement? Is it going to be the Democratic congressman? Is it going to be the children of the Afra? Is it going to be the Cambodian refugee camps? You know, who's suffering more? And everyone is saying, we are the key one. <laughs> and you see that you can't possibly deal with all the suffering. See, when you go up, you say, we are all one, and you come down and you say, but it's my television set. <laughs> See, you've got these levels, too. Because if we're all brothers and sisters, you need it, you use it. Come down and you say, well, now, let's consider this again. The Sufis have a great line. They say, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere along the way, well, the way it happened, uh, there were a lot of clues I had that I was, I was missing the mark by just trying to get high and push away the load. I've got a great image of Alan Watts and I, um, drunk at a Benedictine monastery. <laughs> in the middle of the night. He says, Dick, your problem is, you know you're going to get absolute truth at that moment. <laughs> your problem is you're too attached to emptiness. <laughs> emptiness. Channel six. <laughs> Now, I want to introduce you to another friend of mine. My friend's name is Emmanuel. Um, it's interesting, you, um, you're all, I'm sure, would welcome any friend of mine as a friend of yours. Uh, <laughs> and you say, I have no prejudices. You know, you say you have no prejudices, that you don't care whether people are their race, religion, nationality, but the predicament about Emmanuel is he doesn't have a body. It's like Seth. Now, some of you are saying, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'll allow your other friends, but I don't know about Emmanuel. <laughs> so you didn't know you had prejudices until you find out you're prejudiced about people who don't have body. That's true of all of you. 
And by the way, just because somebody doesn't have a body doesn't mean they know any more than anybody else does. There are a lot of well-meaning plumbers who don't have bodies who are somebody that failed at the stock market in their body and then leave their body. Say, well, I'll help other people give advice. You can go under with it. So just because somebody doesn't have a body, don't, don't take everything they say for truth. <laughs> <laughs> but Emmanuel is a very groovy friend, and he speaks to a woman named Pat Rodergast in Connecticut. Like Seth speaks through Jane Roberts, it's one of those. And Emmanuel says, I say to Emmanuel, Emmanuel, what should I tell people about dying since I, I'm one of my businesses, the dying business? <laughs> and Emmanuel says, tell him it's absolutely safe. <laughs> <laughs> He said, it's like taking off a tight shoe. <laughs> now, who wouldn't trust a friend like that? <laughs> With lines like that. So I said, Emmanuel, what am I doing on earth? What should I do? He said, Ramdas, you're in school. Why don't you try taking the curriculum? <laughs> Why don't you try being a human being? I never thought of that. <laughs> I was busy becoming holy. It was as if I theoretically knew that it was all one, but it was all one except for that stuff that I was pushing away. And I saw at that, somewhere along the line of the past 10 years, I saw that the game was not to get high. The game was to become free. And free meant you weren't standing anywhere. And free meant that you had to embrace your lows as well as your highs. And free meant that as long as you pushed away anything, it had you. You were busy. It's like, promise me in the next 30 seconds you will not think about rhinoceroses. <laughs> Do not think about rhinoceroses. Promise me you won't think about rhinoceroses. Don't think about a rhinoceros now. Everybody agreed? It's that one. It's like the minute you are not doing something, I'm not being Dick Albert, it's got you. Once you recognize that the game, now I'm talking, when Emmanuel's talking to me, he's talking as one soul to another. He's talking to me on Channel 4, and he's saying, what you are doing on Earth is you created a program for yourself. You created a curriculum. It's called... Human 305, and the curriculum is called Richard Alpert. And until you finish that curriculum, we're going to take you, send you back again and again and again. You created the curriculum, why don't you take it? which means from channel four, from a soul's point of view, you now look at your human birth, just the way you've got it right now, just the way it is, and realize that you created it. Manuel says to me, you have the choice. Do you want to be the victim or do you want to be the creator? Now, as long as you identify exclusively with forms of any kind, whether they are conceptual <coughs> forms in your mind of who you think you are, or whether they are forms like this body, forms are in law. They are all happening. They are unfolding. And if you identify that, you experience yourself as like being in a washing machine. It's being, you're being had, you're being taken through. You are determined. You are an unfolding, lawful process, and you experience yourself as being victimized. And most people find it most comfortable to be a victim. They say, well, they say, everything's perfect. If it only weren't for, or it's all perfect, but, I mean, don't you have a butt? Don't you have one of those butts? If it only weren't for the aggression in the world, if it only weren't for the bomb, if it only weren't for this wart, if it only weren't for cancer, if it only weren't for the suffering of my mother, if it only weren't for my economics, if it only weren't for... Everybody's got one of those things. So 
So what part of you is the creator? The part of you that's creator is not speakable a lot. It's, it has no form to it. It's channel five, channel six. It's the one which is the nothing, which is the one which is the zero. I had an interesting teaching about this from a rascal named Shohim Trungpa Rinpoche. He's a uh, Tibetan rascal that practices up in Boulder, Colorado, sometime. I met Shohim Trungpa. Um, I went to Brooklyn to hear him speak in somebody's home, 70, 1974, I guess, 73. He arrived two hours late, drunk. <laughs> now, um, by then, all the people that, I'm not gonna wait for anybody that's two hours late had left. And then when he came in drunk, all the people said, I'm not gonna sit and listen to somebody that's drunk left. So it was down to the people who had nothing else to do that evening. <laughs> All who had an appreciation of country teachings and that, listen, he may be just a late, sloppy drunk, or he may be a tantric teacher. Who knows? You know, you never know with tantras. <laughs> it's always going to get you just where you don't, where you're, I'm not going to, that's the one the tantric teacher goes for. So if it would help you to cut through by his being a drunken, late bum, he'll be that. He doesn't care. If he's a tantric, he may just be a drunken, late bum. You, see? you never know, but you realize in the tantric teaching, it's their problem, not yours. If you treat it as a tantric teaching, you get free through it. What they do is they're showing the business. So he came in late, and he gave a absolute, his lecture was like uh, looking into a, uh, a, a pool a perfectly clear pool. It was just breathtaking. It lasted about 15 minutes. <laughs> and then he drunkenly walked on the stage was standing there, and so I went up and I said, uh, Rinpoche, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate what you just said. I thank you so much. And I was, I was partly really appreciative and partly doing my little ego trip, you know. I'm sort of somebody giving you a, you know, yeah. <laughs> I had my beads with me, my mala beads that I had conspicuously in my hand. <laughs> and as I was talking to him, I dropped my beads. <laughs> Drunk though he was, he bent over very clearly, picked them up, handed them back to me. A very quiet smile. I mean, he just had me right there, and he just did it to me. Right now. So, <laughs> so I got kind of delighted. I mean, these are the little, I'm just going to share up through the weekend these little kinds of teachings you get from different kinds of teachers because it's fun. So a few days later, no, maybe a couple of weeks later, I, was, I heard that he was up at his place up in Vermont called Tailwood Tiger. <coughs> and he was giving a weekend on Don Juan, teachings of Don Juan. So I thought, well, I'm on my way to Montreal. I could drive through Vermont and pick up on one of the lectures. Just sort of sneak in, not pay, you know, just get a quick lecture. <laughs> so I came in early, and uh, my friends were, a lot of my friends were there, and they were out. So I was out in a Volkswagen van in the parking lot preparing for the lecture. <laughs> You don't know what that means. <laughs> and somebody came out and said, Rinpoche wants to see you. Well, I had met him once, and I, you know, I thought, isn't that nice? Fine. So I went up. My ego was all played. Sat into a room. In the room is Rinpoche. He's sitting on a chair. There's only one chair in the room. He's on it. <laughs> Next to him is a a table with a sake bottle and one glass, which he's drinking from. And that's it in the room. So I size up the situation and I kneel in front of him, which is because after all, this man has whether whatever he looks like now, he is somebody that had that was a tulku. He had two hundred tutors by the time he was nineteen years old. He ran one of the largest monasteries in Tibet. He's an incarnation of a very high lama, and uh, etc. So he looks at me, and this, his opening gambit is, he says to me, um, 
Ram Dass, we have to accept responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what do you do with that? Imagine you're sitting there, you're kneeling, like, looking up at the sky, and you're like, Mom, as we have to accept responsibility. Right. <laughs> now, the word responsibility comes out of my whole tradition of be responsible. You know that one. So I give him a, um, I give him a Bhakti Christian parry. <laughs> So I said to him, um, what responsibility, Rinpoche? God has all the responsibility. I have no responsibility. Not my, but thy will, O Lord. <laughs> and he says, you're copping out. <laughs> and then we went on to talk about other things, about the weather and all that stuff. So that was that teaching. That's the main reason I want to tell you that story, but I've got a the funny, uh, there's a very humorous next part to it that I just want to, it's a little digression, but I want to tell you why. Because all these are, are teachings. I go to his lecture afterwards, sitting in the back of the room. He comes in. He's limping, you know, from an accident he had when he drove drunkenly into a joke shop. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a 20 minute lecture on very uninspired lecture on Don Juan. Any questions? First person to ask the question, he says, Why doesn't Ram Dass answer that? <laughs> so I'm sitting in the back and I think, He's getting paid. Why the hell should I ask him? I'm on vacation and I'm kind of out of it, you know? I'm wearing shorts. I don't want to do all that. Everybody goes, yes, yes, found us. Okay, so I come up front. Now he's sitting in a throne chair now. He's got a table next to him which has a big pot of goldenrod, which I'm quite allergic to. He's got a microphone in front of him which is the only microphone that can be heard through. So I have to kneel on the stage behind the gold rod, speak through the gold rod. So I give the answer. I give some sophisticated erudite Harvard professor answer. And I get up and I start to walk back. And he says, next question, he takes the question. He says, why does Ram Dass answer? <laughs> So I come back and I give a sophisticated, and I'm in the middle of giving my second sophisticated answer when I suddenly see what he's done. See, he's teaching a course on Don Juan. He's just made me into Castaneda. And he's just playing. He just created the whole thing. This is this bumbling intellectual, you know, and he's just playing. He's just using the forces of the situation. And I see it, and it absolutely, it's so breathtakingly beautiful the way he did that. That I get up in the middle of the answer, I walk around, I kneel, and I touch his feet, and I say to everybody, do you know what just happened? You're getting a demonstration of the powers of Don Juan. He just did it. He just turned me into that, to live out this form. That's a beautiful, I just wanted to share that with you. That was a nice one. I got a, um, a sterling silver medallion, which my stepmother wears, which uh, Tuesday, the next Tuesday, won the endless knot, uh, with a note from Rinpoche saying, this is in honor of the work we shall do together. Uh, it's a joy to be with you or something. Which didn't always turn out to be the case. <laughs> He's given me great teachings though. Like uh, at one point I had been doing this Vipassana meditation and uh, I was up at, uh, um, in Wyoming, at Snow Lion, Wyoming, at Grand Teton. And he was giving a seminar on crazy wisdom. And I signed up to be interviewed by him, to get an interview. People were signed up to get interviews by me and him, and we were on the same floor, and the outer hall looked like the doctor's waiting office. You know, say, are you for him or me? You know, she, so I signed up to get an interview with him, and I went in and I told him about my meditation practice. And he said, well, now really what you should be doing, Ram Dass, is just expanding outward. Do Mahavipassana. 
He said, why don't we do it together? So we sat there looking at each other. After about 20 seconds, he said, Ram Dass, are you trying? <laughs> and he says, no, don't try, just expand outward. <laughs> That was good. I mean, that was tasty. So, um, coming back to responsibility, and it, it stuck in my craw because why would he call me in to say we've got to accept responsibility? What is he talking about? And I just kept, every now and then it would come into my mind again and again over the years. And now, when Emmanuel was talking to me about do you want to be the creator or the creation, and he said, as the creator, you accept responsibility, and it clicks in. That's what he was talking about. Would I identify with that part of myself which was not in form? And accept that this universe is my creation. So I accept responsibility. Now, in the Bible, it said, had ye but faith, meaning could you get into the space of seeing it all, you could move mountains. But you've got to add the interesting parenthetical remark that had ye that faith and that wisdom to be able to move the mountain, you would know why you put it there in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the same is true of you as a personality in your life. <coughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm now dealing with a thing which is very different in society called affirmation. Because that usually is coming from another level. But at the level where you literally could change things, you are then privy to the wisdom and understanding of why you as a soul created your situation the way you did in the first place. And it is not clear that you would change it. I... Um, We'll be reading over the weekend from this excellent book called Miracle of Love, which is my wrote. <laughs> but there's a beautiful line in it um, by one of the uh, old devotees after Maharaji died. He said, said, he did everything according to nature. A child stays, a young man moves about, an old man stays. He did according to the laws of nature. If he wanted to, he could do. But I don't think he changed nature for himself. When he was sick, he asked about medicines. When he was tired, he used to rest. When he got old, he died. And it's an interesting thing that the quieter you get, and the more you start to hear how it all is, including yourself, the less clearly are you manipulative about it. The more you try to hear your part in the dance and understand the dance has meaning. It isn't an error. It's not like somebody screwed up. And if somebody hadn't screwed up, it would all be nice now. <laughs> if you really hear the term curriculum, so like when I talk with Emmanuel, which I do quite often, I'm, I'm editing his material for just a book to share the stuff he's been teaching. All the things you've ever wanted to ask a spook. <laughs> <laughs> When I listen to that business about school and curriculum, I see the earth plane and our human incarnation is sort of like a, well, it's a little facetious to say it, but of like a fourth grade for dull normals. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, a particular class that we're going through a certain curriculum. It's not the be all end all. It's a certain strata of reality in which certain kinds of opportunities for certain experiences are available. It's like Buddha, when you ask Buddha who, who we are, 
Google lists has these wonderful lists. He has um, five hindrances. He's got um, ten fetters. He's got you know twenty-four no-nos and fifty-two thises and that's. I mean, the the Sudhimaga is full of lists. But just taking the five hindrances to play with. He said, who we are? Well, we've got lust and greed. That's just one. That isn't even two. <laughs> he can't say I have one of these, but not the other. <laughs> lust and greed. He says, I, uh, then the second one is hatred and ill will. The third one is agitation of mind. Fourth one are our old friends sloth and torpor. <laughs> and the fifth one is doubt. Five hindrances. Now, if you were going to set up an intentional community, say, well, who we have in it? Well, let's have people with lust and greed, <laughs> hatred and ill will, agitation, sloth and torpor and doubt. What do you think the community would end up like? This. This. <laughs> this is it. This is the one we created. And people that have those kinds of attachments of mind take birth here. Because this is the place where the sandpaper is available to work through those things. <laughs> working through means you are constantly working to make heaven on earth, even though earth is earth and there is a heaven. Because each individual is going through their own curriculum. The earth is the vehicle through which you're going, just like your body is. And now here is one of the paradoxes that we have to stretch about. And we will be talking about a lot of this, especially tomorrow afternoon we're talking about social action. How do you work to end suffering, and how do you work to bring about peace, and how do you work to bring about heaven when it is all fine as earth, when there's another part of you that sees that the suffering is part of the game? How can you work to end suffering when you understand, you even know that suffering is great? How do you handle that paradox? And this is... What we are about this weekend is to appreciate our predicament as human beings, to stretch, to handle the creative tension that comes from realizing that we are really both human and divine. And that from the divine point of view, we see the perfection, including the suffering, and from the human part, our human empathy makes us want to end the suffering. And we want to preserve the earth and make it last and make it happy and make it healthy and make it ecologically sound as human beings. And as divine beings, we see the perfection, including our desire to do that and including the fact that it is the way it is. And that takes a lot of stretching to be able to handle all of that. See, and at first what happens to most of us is we flip into one level and then flip into another and flip into one and flip into another. And we polarize People say, oh, you're level four. Well, I'm level two. And that was the political activists versus the spiritual folk in the 60s. <clears throat> but that isn't good enough. You and I are all of it. We have the whole ball of wax. And when it says that there is nowhere to stand in the spiritual journey, it means channel one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, stand nowhere. There's nowhere where you are not. And there's nowhere where you are. Because at first you're going up and coming down and going up and coming down. And pretty soon, what is this? Is it up and down? Are we souls? Are we bodies? Is this God at play? Is this serious business? It's like, how do you deal with your suffering? You can see that in your childhood, the suffering you had, no matter how crummy it was, can't you see that that suffering, even though at the time you would have gotten rid of it in a second, can't you see how the fact that you can sit in this room hearing these issues is partly due to the fact that you suffered that way? Can you see that the suffering burned things into you or forced you to go deeper or did something to you? Can't you see that some of that suffering was beneficial? <coughs> 
<coughs> you usually you can say, yes, I see that, but this suffering. <laughs> see that flip? Well, where can you stand that this suffering becomes the curriculum? This suffering. I work with cancer patients. Ah, so cancer. When do you lose it that it's a curriculum and get caught in the curriculum? When do you get caught in the forms and start to suffer? The minute you are attached to form, you suffer. And the minute you deny form, that's an attachment. <laughs> you hear it? You can't grab, you can't push away. You are, as the Bible says, you are in the world, but not of the world. And that is what the teaching of this weekend is about, is how do we figure out how to be in the world, but not of the world? Because what we did is, as we got to touch the part of ourselves that wasn't of the world, the part that in the world kept catching us, and so we wanted to get rid of it because it kept catching us. Like somebody comes to me and says, I want to, I hear you are living in New Mexico now, which isn't true, but they say, I hear you living in Santa Fe. I want to come study with you because I have been living in New York and I can't stand it. <laughs> and I say, well, I don't take on students, but in your case, I'll make an exception and your first assignment as my student is to go live in New York for two years. <laughs> Because New York is just New York. It's not doing anything. You're doing it to yourself through New York. New York is really showing you your own attachments of mind. If there's something that you don't like or you love, that's in you. That is not there. It means you're attached to needs, desires, fears, aversions, etc. And we will be working this weekend a little bit with the third Chinese patriarch of Zen which is this text, and this is the entire text right here. This is another one of Cho Yim Trungpa's gifts to me. He's not even my teacher, I think he's a rascal, but he gives me good things. After he did that meditation with me where he said, I think you're trying, don't try, just, and then as he was, as I was leaving, by the way, he said, you might find it interesting to look at the writings of the third Chinese patriarch of Zen. That was his final words as I walked out the room, door of the room. The Sin Sing Ming, he called. So I said, thank you very much. I could hardly remember the name. I was looking for a pencil to write it down. And I walked down into the lobby, which is at his retreats, is like a big cocktail party. And uh, I'm walking through, and I meet this girl who is a, she's a Canadian who's become a Tibetan nun, a Tibetan Buddhist nun. And she says, oh, Ramdas, I love you so. It's so wonderful to meet you. And we hug and embrace. And she said, oh, I, I want to give you something. <laughs> she goes through her book, her big pocketbook, hands me her Chinese patriarch. Four minutes after she said it to me. Who knows? You know, it's all, you don't believe all of this. <laughs> The first line of the third Chinese patriarch of Zen. The great way, capital G, capital W. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a very small book. <laughs> if you're going to really understand it, if you're going to really hear it. When you got the first line down, I'll give you the second. <laughs> now, can you handle just a little bit more of this one? Just a few more minutes and then I'll... We'll take questions. Because if we have this kind of base camp to work from, even if we want to reject it, if we want to talk from here, then this afternoon we can talk about stages of life like aging and dying and things like that, fun things like that, and then 
tomorrow morning we can reflect on relationships and which is a passing interest to some. <laughs> we can talk about social action. And, uh, or it's all sort of how do you apply this stuff? Tell you what, why don't you take a stretch for two minutes? Because, you know, and let's open the doors and just get some air in, take a stretch, and then just. <laughs> Zen Master Yasutani, our true nature is beyond all categories. Whatever you can conceive or imagine is but a fragment of yourself. Hence, the real you cannot be found through logical deduction or intellectual analysis or endless imagining. Now, in, in the culture that you and I live in, as a separate entity, um, people are identified with their separateness, and the greatest city or power you get in your separateness are your prefrontal lobes, or your, your intellect, thinking mind. And it is out of which comes science, out of which comes technology, the child of science. <coughs> now, it actually doesn't come out of that. It comes through it. I refer you again to that line of Einstein. My understanding of the rational law, of the fundamental laws of the universe, did not come through my rational mind. And what you can visualize is, if you would like to visualize, you can imagine going from, he's trying to solve a problem about the relation of mass and energy. And he's so one pointed at it that just like following the breath, he goes through a doorway into another, another way of being in the universe in which everything is here. It's a gestalt way. It's a subjective way. It's not object. It's not subject-object. The thinking mind always thinks about something. So it's, as long as you're in your thinking mind, you're always one thought away from where the action is. You're always feeling separate from the universe because you're always thinking about the universe. You can imagine Bach just having that doorway open into another realm of relationship to the universe where the sound is, where all the laws are. And if you have that doorway open and then it comes down through you, then you can just sit around writing, uh, just, just all you are really is copying is in this bizarre sense. I mean, you as an instrument are merely a vehicle through which this stuff is coming. And, I mean, somebody like Mozart's output, it's not like he sits down and thinks, well, what do I do today? <laughs> All he does is open up, and then the stuff comes through. It's as if you go into this place where it all is. It's not conceptual. It just all is. And then, as you come back down into form, if you're doing it sequentially, as you come back down into form, if your form happens to be music, it comes out through music. If your form happens to be physics, it comes out through E equals MC squared. If your form happens to be art, it comes through David, the sculpture of David, the sculpture of David by uh, Michelangelo and so on. And you can sense, it's what we really call genius, is that quality of beings able to, and you can tell the difference between uh, when you're listening to, to uh, artists, listening to musicians or seeing artists, you can see, like when you look and you become very aware of the vehicle, like you say about a musician, um, uh, or you say that's a good composition, or you say 
his technique or her technique is good. That's one level of experience. But if you're, if that musician is listening to another realm through which, and then just playing, as you listen, you start to go to that other realm and you can transcend the focus on the medium. And the, the artist becomes irrelevant, really. The artist is merely a servant to this process that allows the circle to be complete. And when you're listening to, like when you're listening, for example, to when I, I used to, uh, I'm a cellist, and I used to listen to the Boston Symphony all the time in the old days. And when I go to the Boston <laughs> Symphony, there would be moments where the symphony orchestra itself was irrelevant. It was as if we had all entered into a, a realm of sound that the auditory canal and the ear could really hear the approximation of. You were hearing more than you could hear, as Black Elf says in the Ogallala Soup. The Ogallala Soup. You hear more than you can hear. You know more than you can know. Now, what I'm talking about, <coughs> and what Zen Master Yasutani is talking about, is connecting with another way of being in the universe other than through the thinking mind. But the thinking mind is very addicting because it gives us so much power. And it's very, the thinking mind puts us on the moon, the thinking mind does all these, the thinking mind gives us technology, the thinking mind is, gives us so much stuff. And to hear the, <laughs> that the thinking mind, which we grew up, I grew up learning the statement cogito ergo sum. I studied Latin and it said, I think, therefore I am. Meaning you are an identity with your thinking mind. I am the thinker. Now, it turns out that that is not a transcendent statement. <laughs> the, the transcendent statement is sum et cogito, I am and I think. Not, I am, my, I am not the thinker. Thinking is something that is available to me. Thinking is a servant, not a master. But for most people, it's the master. They identify with their thoughts. Like you wake up in the morning, and from the moment you wake up, you start things like, gotta go to the bathroom. <laughs> Could sleep five more minutes. It's warm in that corner of the bed. <laughs> Got to do the laundry. Wonder if the stove is still hot. Smell coffee. Oh, I'm so sleep. What was I dreaming about? Got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> what if the car start? And on you start. You just start. It's like a ship hammer. Think, 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 think. And each one is your mind. Your awareness is. Just imagine your awareness being the light, and it's like, what do I think? And each thought's coming forth saying, think of me, think of me, I'm real. <laughs> and a lot of the meditative techniques are designed to allow you to see the way in which your thoughts are capturing your awareness all the time. Until you get to the point where you can rest in your awareness Allowing the thoughts, which aren't going to stop, because the thoughts are like neural runoffs. They are chemical runoffs, a neurochemical, electrical chemical system. And they're just coming by, and you get to so the point is like you are sitting by a river in which uh, twigs and leaves are fall, going down the river, and you're just sitting, focusing on a point in the river, and these things are floating by. Thoughts are coming, and thoughts are going. Thoughts are coming, and thoughts are going. So that, for example, if you were doing the meditation we started with this morning, when I first started to do that, I, it was a delicious experience. Because I was in India, and I went to Bodh Gaya, which is where Buddha got enlightened, and I signed up for a meditation course with Sri Goenka, who was a very good meditation master. And a hundred people, and we're all sitting in a hall, and he says, he comes in, and he sits down, and he looks like the Buddha saying, <laughs> Bring the attention, the tip of the nose. <laughs> right, got that. <laughs> Follow the breath. Breathing in, <laughs> breathing out. He repeats everything three times, which I won't repeat. So you do that. Got it. 
<laughs> then I'm waiting for the next instruction. <laughs> Keep the awareness on the breath. Right, okay. Do not let the awareness stray from the breath. I begin, I think. I think. <laughs> Is this all he's going to say? <laughs> Do not let the mind wander. Has he got it? He just wants to bring the awareness back to the breath. Okay. <laughs> this is never going to work. <laughs> Keep the attention on the breath. <laughs> My knee hurts. <laughs> Do not let the mind go to any sensations. Keep the awareness with the breath. For this, I got a PhD. They should see me back at home. <laughs> And on it goes, and you can see your mind, you just start to bring it to one place, and it grows. And each one says, I'm real, think of me. So you're sitting there and you say, I forgot to call, I forgot to call Dan. Well, I'll just call Dan, then I'll meditate. And it grabs you, and you agree that you're going to meditate for 20 minutes, and for 20 minutes, except if the house burns down, you're just going to meditate. You're just going to follow your breath. And you see it's impossible because the mind will come with more and more seductive things to think about. You know, you'll become so hungry. What else soon lunches? Are we going to have I, mean, I used to get so that I could sit for six hours looking as if I was following my breath, having one long fantasy. <laughs> and keep the awareness of And I didn't even notice. He could have been talking Swahili. I never even heard his language. I never even heard the words. I was just thinking about when I go out with yogic powers, how good I do with them. Now, what is it that takes you out of your mind? And I don't mean, see, the, the statement, I'm out of my mind, is it a pejorative statement or is it great? You know, somebody says, I'm afraid I'm going out of my mind. Well, I say, I hope so. <laughs> it just keeps flipping the consciousness around as to what the game is. Because, uh, uh, and it's interesting because universities, so it turns out, it, you know, it's like cogito, I think, therefore I am confused, is really <laughs> to fulfill the philosophy of it. Tomorrow in social action, we'll see how the thinking mind leads us into bizarre situations like nuclear yeah. nuclear war. So it's cogito, ergo, boom. <laughs> Even the little ones I pick up along the way. <laughs> Now, um, each of us has things that take us outside of our thinking mind into, which is going through the doorway, into this other way of knowing about the universe. And the word we use, which we've used for a long time, and which is familiar to us, is a, a word that's comfortable in the West. It's called intuition, an intuitive way of being in the universe, an intuitive sense. And um, I, when I was... Um, professoring back in the 50s and early 60s, we were very chauvinistic and uh, very narrow and very, and very attached to the thinking mind because a university is like a temple that worships the thinking mind. And professors are the priests of that religion. And anything you can't know, you know it isn't. So I realized that nine-tenths of what I am had nothing to do with what I should know I knew with my thinking mind, and therefore it wasn't. It's like the, uh, that story of the drunk looking for the watch, and somebody comes along to help him, and they're under a street lamp, and the fellow's looking, and finally he says, well, where exactly did you lose the watch? And the drunk points up the alley. Well, what are you looking here for? He says, because there's a light here. <laughs> well, that's the situation that you end up studying what your thinking mind can snow as an object, and everything that it can't, you say, is irrelevant. Well, it turns out most of what we are ends up in the category of irrelevant, as we're talking about today. 
And so when I first started to experience transcendent states or altered states of consciousness, I saw that what I knew as a psychologist had very little to do with that. It came up to the door, but it couldn't get through because it needed to know it knew. And all the time, and so what we'd said in those days was, tough people think, weak people and women <laughs> in <Europe. laughs> And isn't it bizarre how it's turned out? Because the intuition, the intuitive mind is really the salvation of humanity, by the way, of the world, is the intuitive connection, which, and just as the whole power relationship of women is changing in the world, that whole quality of being in the world in a different way, of just that, of wisdom as opposed to knowledge, instead of more Henry Kissinger's, more knowledge of other people, you are starting to, we're starting to honor something called wisdom which is something that we learn from our American Indian friends that keep saying, my friends keep saying to me, you know, they touch the earth, they say, come on back to your connection, the way in which you are connected to the universe, which is not through objective knowledge. That's merely a manifestation of our isness. It isn't the root isness of our being. So the question is, how do you get into your intuitive well, um, Often you get into your intuitive mind when your rational mind just can't handle a situation. <laughs> when it just boggles. It just boggles. And um, like here's an example of boggle. <coughs> a boggle. This is one I've been using a lot to deal with suffering. Um, I was in Benares. I was at, uh, going to take a bath in the in the Ganges River, which is very auspicious to take a bath in the Ganges River. There's floating corpses and things, and, it's, and you take a swim, and then you it's out of the water, it comes out of the top of Shiva's head, and it's very good. It's as good a way to die as any other. <laughs> okay. So um, on my way, I pass about a hundred lepers that have begging balls. And I'm with a friend of mine, and we share our coins, and I end up with 20 coins. I got a, some 10 pice coins, some 25 pice, 50 pice, and ruby coins. And I start to, I get 20 coins, and I start to go down a line of about 120 lepers. And I find myself, I mean, I am horrified by my own mind. I am sitting there, thinking, standing there, walking there, thinking, he's missing a nose. That's ten pice. <laughs> she has no feet. That's about a, that's fifty pice. <clears throat> and I saw that I was rationally trying to deal with suffering. Mm. And there was no way I could do it. There's no way I could do it. And the the absurdity of my predicament pushed me into another level where I just started to trust the universe and felt part of everything, and felt part of them, and they, me, and the 20 coins, and their needs, and my availability, and all. And I just walked down the line, looking into their eyes, and every now and then I'd put a coin, and I just trusted the whole process. And at the end, I didn't have guilt. I was there, they were there, they didn't seem upset. I had done what I could do. It was all seemed fine. <clears throat> well, if I had done it with this, I would have ended up feeling caught in my judging mind. I would have ended up suffering incredibly, not being able to look at them, etc. It turns out they have a union and they share all their coins, you know. I mean, and they have warehouses full of grain and stuff, but I didn't know that. <laughs> so I got the teaching from it. Anyway. Well, there's one example of being forced into the intuitive. I'm going to tell another story now that is, uh, it's a delicious story, and I've told this many times also. It's about two other of my teachers about, that have taught me about how to be in the intuitive mind. And these two teachers are uh, named Joe and Rosie, and they are bottlenose dolphins. And um, <coughs> John and Tony Lilly do research with dolphins. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to swim with a dolphin. And I said, 
Of course. Because <laughs> good guys want to swim the planet. <laughs> so I, I found myself on this kind of gray, cold day in Redwood City, where these big tanks research station one. In my bathing suit, I didn't have a wetsuit. And I went into the tank on the holding platform, and then I got into the water where I was treading water. And that was the first moment I had quite, up until then, I had been busy gonna swim with the dolphins. Yeah. Now I was in the water and I suddenly thought, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> you know, it's those moments of truth when you, or those moments of comeuppance when you, <laughs> how did I get into this one? Oh my God, I was just, here I am, this sort of 50-year-old guy in a cold day, and I'm, what am I doing? And, you know, I have to swim with some fish, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> You know, I'm trying to remember stories about what do you do with dolphins. But everybody's around the tank, people around the tank watching to see how best does with the dolphins. So whatever I do, I'm going to smile. I know that. 